like to welcome everyone to this August 19th meeting of the Corsicana ISD Board of Trustees. This is a regularly scheduled meeting and all items that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby under audience for guests and follow the instructions on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, establish a policy, provide oversight, and approve personnel and budget. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. That is a responsibility of our superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, give every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and provide a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. And these are our core values. We thank you for your interest in the students of CISD. So we do have a quorum. All seven board members are in attendance. And the first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. We have uh, two members from the CHS FFA um, Club and Molly Gomez and Sarah Beck will lead us in the pledge. Next, we will have the invocation given by board member Chris Minkins. Next on the agenda is recognition. Uh, Ms. Johnson, if you would like to come up and introduce your group. Do you want them back up there? Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay. This way? That way? Okay. All right. Um, my name is Miranda Johnson. I'm one of the ag teachers at the high school. Um, Caitlin Jackson, Mark Vitters, and Kim Potter are both also all back here. Um, and these are two of our kids that are going to nationals this year. We have a third student. We have a third student going to nationals, but she's already at college, so she's not here. Um, Emery Dowd is not here, but she will be receiving her American degree at the National FFA Convention. Um, and then Sarah Beck is going to serve as one of the voting delegates for the state of Texas. We have 63 of them across the whole state. Um, and Sarah will get to be on board meetings and make decisions at the national level for FFA. And then Molly Gomez is a state champion in science fair and she will be competing as a national finalist um, in indianapolis as well and she also received a thousand dollars for winning state contest as a scholarship so those are girls. Thank you. 
Thank you to our FFA department and all the work that you put in. You put in a lot of hours and it pays off because we have a phenomenal uh, FFA club and organization and it shows through all the awards that they win year after year after year and being on the state board and being recognized nationally. So great job and we, we truly appreciate everything you do for that, for that um, organization and your department. Now I would like to ask Erin Richter with FCCLA to come up for her presentation. She, want, she wants me to introduce her. <laughs> uh, this is Erin Richter. She is a current senior at the high school um, this past year, her junior year. Uh, she competed with FCCLA in the STAR event uh, Teach and Train. She is a future educator. Um, she went through my instructional practices program, and so she mentored with Mrs. Rojas at Fannin. Um, and so she did her presentation, her project over teach and train. Um, and so she competed at the region level. She got first at region. She went to state. Um, she was second at state, and then she went to compete in nationals the, in Seattle this past June. Um, she competed against 49 others, and she was in the top 10 um, finalist pool, um, and she got a gold medal. So uh, we are very, very proud of her, and she is here to present her project. Okay, is this, okay. Good afternoon, my name is Erin Richter. I'm a senior at Horse County High School, where I'm also the current vice president of FCCLA. For my lessons, I chose to do repeated addition and subtraction, which is second grade multiplication and division. Before I get into that, though, I'd like to go over some introductory details. Here's a table of contents. It's got everything we'll be covering. Uh, the intro includes the FCCLA planning process summary page, the evidence of online submission, the career exploration, and the self-assessment. The next section, lessons, is me going over the lessons I planned and presented. Finally, the conclusion includes my evidence of presentation, as well as my evidence of technology, the best practices, educator shadowing, and my work cited. As I said, my name is Erin Richter. I'm a student intern for the practicum and education class where I go to a second grade class during math time every day to help teach second grade students. I noticed that my students were struggling with independent repeated addition and subtraction, and so I decided to make a review lesson. I needed to have three activities. My goodness, sorry. <laughs> I needed to have three activities, each one being as understandable and on topic as possible. I had originally planned to do these activities on January 22nd, but our bus was late, and so I had to do it on the 23rd instead. <laughs> um, so I, as I said, I had to do this on the 23rd. My students were very excited to see me because they knew I was doing a lesson. They knew I had stickers as part of their lesson, and so they were really hyped up. Um, they did enjoy this lesson, and it really helped my uh, mentor, Ms. Rojas, because they had a test coming up, and as I said, they were really struggling. <laughs> This was just something I had to do at state. It gave me a point on my uh, rubric. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now to get into the career exploration. I found that for, back, for, excuse me, for math teachers, a bachelor's degree is ideal. Um, really, I think that's for any teacher in any subject, but that's, that's really what I found. Also, this job description simply states that teachers must be fully prepared and able to guide, educate, and discipline students to ensure they learn the proper skills. Um, some skills needed for this career, obviously communicating, listening, and understanding how to discipline students. According to the US Bureau, excuse me, US Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are about 67,000 job openings for high school math teachers across the country, and employment is not expected to change. Um, question number five, I believe that my mom, Andrea Richter, would be the perfect mentor for me. Obviously, it might sound a little biased. She is one of the best teachers I've ever had. She I've had perfect grades in her class, and it's not because she's my mom. Trust me, it's because she's an amazing teacher. Uh, finally, teachers can start as subs or aides, and then later can advance to become curriculum coaches, counselors, or assistant principals. Now onto my self-assessment. Uh, these questions are very easy for me to answer, obviously. I just told you my mom is a great teacher. I've been surrounded by teachers my entire life. I've been running around CISD since I could run. <laughs> As for my personal skills and learning style, I am a visual learner, which means that I learn best when I have things like notes and 
PowerPoints and instructions in front of me. And my personal skills, like I said, I have been surrounded by teachers. I think I'm very good at helping others learn. I'm also very organized. I'm very passionate and driven. <sighs> Describe what appeals to you. Like I said, I'm a teacher's kid. I have always been a teacher's kid. And I know it's a difficult job, and I know it's very fulfilling, and I am willing to sacrifice you know, whatever it takes to be an amazing teacher like my mom. Some, only, some, excuse me, some other aspects I have considered, I get nervous. I mean, who doesn't get nervous? Um, I, do, I do like to crack jokes when I'm really nervous, especially if I don't have a, a speech in front of me. So yeah. Now onto my lessons. <laughs> Okay, lesson one, which is the lesson I presented to my second graders, is repeated addition. I took 50 minutes to teach this lesson. Um, the TEEK is 110.4B6A, which just means that students will complete the repeated addition word problems with 100% accuracy. And the National Family Consumer Sciences Standards are 4.5, 4.5.1, 2, and 5. That's just something I had to do for that. Okay, my activity number one was repeated addition matching. I took 10 minutes for this activity. Students simply um, matched up cards to the correct, what we call number sentence, which is just like five times two equals 10, and then they matched the correct card to that. You'll see I have pictures on here in just a minute. Activity number two was the four square stationary stations. I had originally intended for my students to move around the classroom, but like I said, they were very excited to see me, and I thought, that's not a great idea to have them move around like that. And so instead, they rotated cards at their tables, um, cards that I made, word problem cards, and then they made models using stickers, and then they made the correct number sentences. Again, you'll see that in just a minute. And activity number three, which was the assessment, was a Kahoot that I made. I had made a whole entire Kahoot account just for that Kahoot. <laughs> And then some sources I use, Amy Tao and Teacher Pay Teacher, um, Kahoot, and then I use like a lot of like fonts and stuff like for my presenting. Oh, some improvement ideas. I could have been more clear with my students. I was a little bit frustrated because they wouldn't chill out, and so I was having a hard time like explaining to them what was going on. I could have used my time more wisely. I am a teenager. It's not my greatest quality of, you know, <laughs> using my time in the best way. But I did try to get them through it, and I did end up getting them through it efficiently. All right, that is the four, um, excuse me, that is the matching cards. You see, they, I just cut those cards out and they matched them. They did that as a table. This is the four square stationary stations. You can see the stickers that they used to make their models. It was very cute. And then that is the, that's the, Excuse me, that's the exit ticket that I neglected to mention uh, that went with the four square stationary stations. They just wrote the correct number sentences to go along with those pictures. Uh, and then there's proof that I made the Kahoot. I had to have that for technology purposes. Lesson number two was the monster craft. It was, again, repeated addition. The time frame and the TEKS and the NFCS standards remain the same. Uh, so activity number one was the monster worksheet. I will let you know that I made the worksheet and the craft from scratch. Like I just kind of came up with it on my own. They spent 15 minutes for this. They just solved word problems and then their answers went along with how their monster looked, which you'll see in just a moment. Activity number two and three was the monster craft. I knew it would take a long time. You'll see they just, like I said, used the corresponding answers from the worksheet that I made and built their monster. So there is the, uh, <laughs> There's the worksheet, and you see I made those answers, and I even put the answers in there where you could see that you know the monster has four legs and has six arms on the right, and stuff like that. And then there's the monster. <laughs> Lesson three was repeated subtraction. I definitely kept this simpler. The time frame and NFCS standards are the same, but the TEEK is 110.4B6B, which just means that students will solve the repeated subtraction word problems correctly. Activity number one was the snowball subtraction game. This was my favorite. Um, so it's a very simple, very simple, like kindergarten level subtraction problem that was on a little piece of paper and they were, the idea is for them to crumble it up and throw it around the classroom because I know kids like to throw things and why not give them an activity where they're allowed to do that. They just threw it around for a few minutes and then solved whatever problem they ended up with. Activity number two was the main one. I did make this uh, activity myself from scratch. It's the hidden message scavenger hunt. So they were supposed to solve the 
word problems correctly and then show the teacher and then they could go and solve the hidden message and then get the prize. The hidden message, by the way, is candy and so their prize is candy. Activity number three was the exit ticket. It was just one simple word problem that I did make from scratch. Uh, it was supposed to be like challenging but also doable, you know, after all this practice at the beginning. There's the snowball subtraction and then there's the exit ticket. I got the snowball subtraction idea from Pinterest. And then there's the scavenger hunt. You see, uh, they use the hints that are given to solve for the correct word. All right, evidence of presentation. This is what I had to do to get, an, like I said, a point on my rubric. There's just me, you know, going over lessons and there's a group picture, there's some one-on-one. -on -one. Evidence of technology, like I said, the, there's a YouTube video that I did when I showed up to get ready. There's them doing it. And then there's me giving the kahoot. All right, now on to shadowing. Um, so I worked under Ms. Sonia Rojas. She was at Fannin and now she's teaching English at the high school and she's also doing the Sapphire dance team. So that's really cool, I get to see her sometimes. She helped me so much through all this. She was so understanding. She really made me realize that being an educator is what I want to do. I mean, I think I've always known that I wanted to be a teacher, but I really was like, when I had my first class and I knew all their names and it was just so wonderful. On field day, it was my very last day, and one of my students like hugged me and cried, and so then I cried, and so it was just really embarrassing. <laughs> um, but I was crying. I went to Old Mexican Inn. I was crying at Old Mexican Inn. <laughs> um, but really, Miss Rojas is an excellent teacher. She really has passion and she's driven. And when she told me she was coming to the high school, I was so excited. I told her she was so smart. She could teach anything. She went with English, but I really was like, you could really do anything. Actually, my mom taught her, so that was cool. <laughs> there she is. And then there's me with my practicum and education class. And then there's a door I had to do for that class. And I made ornaments with all their names on it. And then here's my work cited. That's, that's all I got. <laughs> Great job, Erin. Uh, I'm pretty sure any principal in town will be trying to hire you. They will be arguing over you quickly, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, she will be uh, certified for education for educational aid, so we'll scoop her up here. All right, ready? Got it, thank you. <laughs> Great job, Ms. Richter. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Uh, next on the agenda is audience for guests. I'm going to read uh, their introduction to public comment. <clears throat> the CSD Board of Trustees encourages comments about the district from citizens of the district, from district employees, <laughs> or from other members of the public. Anyone wishing to speak may do so at this time. The board asks that each participant's comments pertain to public education and be no longer than three minutes per person. The board also respect, respectfully requests that the speaker refrain from mentioning other students or parents and staff members by name when addressing their concerns. Under the Texas Open Meetings Act, the board is not permitted to discuss or act upon any issue that are not posted on the agenda for tonight's meeting. This means the board members are unable to deliberate, ask questions, provide you with a response, or take any action relating to your comments. If an issue mentioned is listed on tonight's agenda, the board's deliberation of the issue will be deferred until the appropriate time during the meeting. In addition, the board has adopted a complaint policy that, that are designed to secure at the lowest level, lowest administrative level, a prompt and equitable solution of complaints and concerns. Complaints brought by employees, students, or parents may be brought in accordance with our local school board policy. Each of these processes provide 
that if a resolution cannot be achieved administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of our district policy on public participation in meetings and filing complaints can be found on our website. If you need assistance with these policies or processes, please call Merrill Harrison in the superintendent's office. So at this time, we are going to call Mr. Ron Capehart with Lineberger. And you have three minutes, sir. We will, we will if you have more checks, <laughs> you'll let me take as long as yeah. I'd like this evening. <laughs> Superintendent Howell, members of the board, uh, I am Ron Capehart, your delinquent tax attorneys. Uh, as you know, from time to time, uh, when we ultimately have to seize and sell property for the collection of the delinquent taxes, uh, if those properties sell for more than the taxes and expenses that are due, that money goes into the registry of the court and the taxpayer, the delinquent taxpayer, has a period of two years to make application to receive those funds. Uh, if application is not made within that two years, then those monies, uh, per the state statute, uh, go back to the taxing entities on a pro rata share uh, for each of those individual properties. Uh, and so tonight, uh, in, uh, in celebration of a uh, the starting of the new school year, we're going to have Christmas in August. Uh, I did not wear my bright red Santa Claus suit because it's 104 outside and it's just entirely too hot for that. Uh, but tonight I bring to you excess proceeds for two properties uh, that we sold a little over two years ago uh, that did have excess proceeds and no applications were made. So tonight I'm going to present uh, Superintendent Howell with two checks totaling $139,465.48. Uh, as you know, these are non-budget uh, monies, so the board can use those as you see fit. They are not allocated to any specific budget item uh, because they are excess proceeds. So at this time, I'm going to present the, these two checks to Superintendent Howe. Ron, we appreciate you, we appreciate Linebarger and all you do to collect monies for the district. Uh, you are welcome here anytime. Um, that far exceeds and will go to uh, our deficit budget. So thank you so very much. All right. All right, next. Uh, for audience, for guests, we have Terry Garner. Mr. Garner, you will have three minutes. Uh, our secretary, Mr. Brad Farmer, will keep time, and we will give you a notice at one minute that you have one minute left. Thank you. Terry Garner, I'm a concerned parent of a Corsica County ISD student. We went to Bowie last year. This year, we're in Collins. The reason I'm coming is because I'm real concerned about the notification issues that we had from the event last week, the assault we had last week. We already have a hard time finding good teachers here. We've been blessed to have the best teachers uh, for our daughter going from kindergarten on. So, um, but I'm concerned that we called this not what it was. It was an attack. When we send out a notice on Facebook that there's an issue at the school and we don't notify the parents via text message, that's even worse. That doesn't look transparent to the community, okay? And that was an attack. We need to do better. We had the same issue at Bowie last year. I think you know in the SPED class, there was an issue in the SPED class and some people were arrested, right? We had an issue this year. That tells me we're not taking a proactive approach to how we look at these classes. We may need to hire a consultant, I know money's tight, to go into those classes and tell us what we may need to do different. Like, there shouldn't have been a clothes hanger in the class. There shouldn't have been this. There may be a special color the class needs to be painted. But we need psychiatrists. We need to protect our teachers. They're rare and they're hard to come by. We're not protecting our teachers and we're not protecting our students. 
and we're definitely not notifying the parents. Thank you. Next audience for guests is Keith Dowler. Good evening. I already addressed this with Ms. Howell, but I want to put all you guys on warning. My daughter has been sexualized at school four, by four different teachers at Collins within six days. Three happened today, one happened last Wednesday, and it must stop. If it doesn't stop, a legal action will happen. Next on the agenda is the superintendent report. Um, I was able to talk to Ms. Rogers uh, this afternoon and she has uh, given me the okay to give an update. Uh, Ms. Rogers is at home and recovering. Uh, she just continues to ask for your prayers for her complete healing and continue to pray for our students and our staff at Collins and of course the entire district. Um, as a district, we will have a gene day on Friday. Um, all proceeds from this Gene Day will go to the Rogers family. So we will start um, advertising that tomorrow on uh, social media, through the campuses, but all proceeds will go to the Rogers family. Uh, we're also collecting gift cards throughout all the campuses. We've had lots of, um, our community is amazing, and they've all wanted to help Miss Rogers and Coach. Um, we're trying not to overwhelm them with everything, but we're, so we're collecting gift cards for restaurants, um, gas cards, um, things like Walmart or HEB, so if Coach needs to go get groceries, he can do that easily, have that delivered, or uh, go in the pickup line at HEB, because it is uh, he is in the middle of football season as well. So um, We also have several community members who are planning other fundraisers, and as those get planned, we will announce those throughout the district. But she um, was in good spirits today and, and really wanted us to give everyone an update. That's good news, and we are so glad that she is home and recovering, so. All right, next is discussion and action items. Um, first is the back to school report. So last week was our first week of school. Um, of course, it didn't go exactly the way we had planned. However, we're getting a redo this week. But at the end of last week, we had 5,930 students. Uh, we'll continue to see an increase each day probably throughout the rest of the month in early uh, September. Congratulations to Mr. Betts. He has 217 pre-K uh, students at the moment. Uh, so they are, we have a lot of pre-K students. Uh, maybe more today, I'm not sure. That was as of Friday. So um, at the high school on Friday, he had 1827. We up? Yeah, 1843. Okay, great. Middle school, 861 on Friday. Uh, Collins Intermediate, 882. Navarro Elementary, 560. Uh, Sam Houston, 418. Fannin, 360. Carroll with pre-K and K through four is 541. And then Bowie is 481. So we have students that are um, enrolling every day. So we're excited about that. Um, on the first day of school, we had several groups, the Calicos, cheerleaders, baseball team, our board, each person from um, on the board went to a campus to um, welcome our students. We had community members at Fannin, uh, Northside Baptist, uh, bus their, their people over, and it was pretty awesome. First Baptist was involved, multiple churches. We had a really great uh, first day back. Uh, we had a football scrimmage versus Van on Friday night, so we had a great attendance for that, even when it was over 100 degrees. And um, just as a reminder, Meet the Tigers will be Wednesday night of this week at 6.30 p.m. at CHS in the gym. So we hope everyone can come out and join us for Meet the Tigers. Great, thank you. All right, next on the agenda is CHS night school, optional flexible school day program. Madam President, Ms. Howell, board members, uh, before you, you have an application for the optional flexible school day program. This is a type of funding from TEA that must be approved before we claim it on our students. This program would allow us to receive funding for our CHS night school students. Previous years, ESSER 3 was used, but that money is expiring on August 31st. Uh, to understand how the funding works, 
Uh, we can look at a student who attends CHS during the day. They generate full funding after four hours. Night school students cannot achieve this because it's after school hours and they only do two hours a night. The optional flexible school day program would allow them to accrue hours over multiple days. This means that after attending night school for two nights, they would have reached four hours and can now generate a full day's funding. Uh, night school staffing has been adjusted to be sure we come in under or at budget with this additional uh, revenue. Any questions? How many students do we average in night school? Uh, between 25. And 30. Graduated 45 last year. All right. Any questions? I move to approve the optional flexible school day program application. So I have a motion to approve the optional flexible school day program application. Second. I second. So a motion is second to approve the optional flexible school day program application. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes, thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, next is tax rate discussion, school funding, and 2024-2025 budget. All right, okay. good evening again. Uh, we are going to begin with a history of our tax rate since 2019. Um, as you can see, there's been a steady decline, including what is proposed for next year. Uh, to be specific, the M&O rate went down uh, a little bit. So our total rate did go down. That red uh, number there, that is the decrease since 23-24. Now, can you tell, for, for those that do not know, how is our tax rate determined? Yeah. So we get our property values from Navarre County and Freestone County. We send those values off to Region 12. They put it into a template that is, they get from TEA, and it spits out the numbers. Um, I've gone in to verify that the correct property values were actually in there. Um, our bond payments, everything in there is correct, and these are the values uh, that TEA and Region 12 propose. And for those that do not know what TEA stands for, it's Texas Education Association. Yes. And they are the ones that determine and tell us what our tax rate will be. We right. don't, we're not able to vary from, from right. what they tell us. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. And looking at our tax rate from last year, um, well, 2022, 2023, we were at uh, 1.162. Yeah. We dropped almost 30 cents last year, um, and then we're just dropping 0 .0023 this yes. year, correct? Yes. So it's minimal, but we did have a significant decrease last year. Correct, okay. correct. All right, so school funding. Um, as we know, school funding is, we are funded by our local property taxes and state funds, state taxes. Um, State funds make up the majority of it in our district. Uh, part of the calculation though, right, when we get all of our funds, is it's based on average attendance rate. So we project that we're gonna have 6,050 kids enrolled. Of those kids, we're predicting 5,600 on average will show up every day. That's a 92.5 attendance rate, okay? So that is how we're funded. We're funded on attendance, 92.5%. Uh, we are not funded on having 6,050 kids in our schools every day, though our teachers uh, do prepare for all of them. They have to. And we prepare. And we, we staff, yes, yes, yes. Teachers, bus drivers, yes. cafeteria staff, we buy food to feed Correct. that many students. Correct. But we only get paid for the 5,600 or whatever that number will be. Right. Okay. Right. Which so we're not getting paid for 450 kids, basically. Correct. Correct. Okay. And that's why we're stressing and focusing on attendance this year, because it, it really does matter. Um, the formula, though, has not been adjusted since 2019. So we are working off of a 2019 formula, 2019 economy, a Texas economy. 
In 2023, there was an opportunity to change that formula. They did not. Uh, that is a no increase in the student allotment. That is, that is the bulk of what we get. So as local tax collection increases like it did this year, uh, state funding decreases. And so one of the questions that, that districts ask and would like to know more about is, so you, the, the state budgeted a certain amount and then we throw our tax rate in there and our, our property values and then their amount goes down. Well, what happened to the, to the other bid, okay? And that is, that is a question a lot of districts are asking because it doesn't necessarily stay in education. It could go to another department. It could go to other idea, grand ideas that they might have. Um, they've also, 2023, had some unfunded mandates. One of them was requiring an officer uh, on every campus. Now, that did not really affect us in our budget, but for so many other districts, it did. That, that, of course, you know salaries are the biggest part of the budget, so just forcing districts to have uh, positions they didn't have previously, that's a problem. What would you say the percentage of our budget is for for salary, for payroll? About 85. 85% of our budget goes yeah, to payroll. 84, 85. Yes. How many employees do we have? We are between 850 and 900. 850 uh, to 900 yeah. employees. I would say, yeah. And about teachers were like 440, 430. Um, school funding, like I said, it's 2019. Well, a lot has changed in the economy, and inflation is one of them. Uh, energy, fuel, our insurance has gone up a million dollars over six years. Um, that's just that there's nothing else that's coming in to supplement that. And that's our insurance on our facilities. Our property, I'm sorry. Yes, and our, our buses mm -hmm. and, and vehicles, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and we've been great with, I think, um, I think we agree that we've been great with our salary increases for our teachers, our auxiliary staff to match the cost of living. Of course, and we know that that, you know, the formula hasn't changed. So we're just doing it uh, because we know we need to. Um, this is a previous graphic we've all looked at, but just to bring it back into play and to remind ourselves of the percentages that have gone up. Um, fuel, 48%. General, I mean, insurance has been just the talk of so many districts. Um, as you know, we, we, well, you may not know, we are grouped into a North Texas in the DFW area for our property and risk insurance. And that is the number one region in Texas that receives hail damage. And that is what the insurance companies are worrying about. Um, so it, it, it's astronomical um, and it's, it's basically in every conversation I've had. Uh, construction costs, we know materials have uh, gone up, labor's gone up, uh, we see the health insurance costs, and of course we've seen food service as well. Uh, food products, uh, prices are up, and, and labor is up. <clears throat> Parent budget, uh, at that 92.5% attendance, uh, we're looking at this $62.3 million number for our revenue. Current expenses budgeted, 64.8. That leaves us a deficit of 2.523. Um, that's where we're at. We've had uh, several budget meetings. We've, we've done our best to cut. Uh, we've done a fabulous job, I think, of staffing. Um, and making sure that the people here, the people we need to function, and, and I can stand by that. I can stand by uh, the hires, the, the decision making. Uh, we've got the people we need in the spots that they're supposed to be. Um, and so that deficit, while unfortunate, and the, those are ex expenses, that is real. This is what it takes to run CISD on a daily basis with what we've got. So, and I think we've had, we have some great minds uh, and committees that have come together to, to figure out how, how to do this uh, as efficiently as possible. And for those that do not know, we, have, we did put together um, a finance committee um, and have worked over the summer to 
dig down deep and figure out where we can cut, um, what, where we can save, and without affecting what's most important is student, our students and their education. And so we have we've really done a thorough job of that. I mean, we were looking at, at trash bags. Um, yeah, we've looked at trash bags. We've looked at, uh, we've, through attrition, did we need to uh, replace certain staff members? Um, I think every department has come together, every campus to look at, every, we've looked at every single line that we spend um, or have spent in the last, I mean, we've done three to four years back. Um, I mean, we've really worked really hard to, I mean, when we're looking at, at trash bags, I mean, that tells you that we've gone down to every single thing that we can try to save money on custodial supplies, um, food, how, how are we buying our food? Where can we get that from? Can we look at other vendors? So we've, um, Sean and his team and everyone and all the departments has done, have done a, an excellent job to get our budget at the 2.5. It was larger than that several weeks ago, but we have gotten that down. And I believe that with attendance, working on attendance and really being frugal throughout the year, I'm hopeful that we will not have this deficit in August. Yeah, and I, I applaud the conversations that are going on. Uh, the departments are just talking to each other all the time. Uh, very intentional about dealing with this across the department. So I appreciate it and uh, we're stewards of taxpayer money and, and I think we're doing the best we can. And Sean, I wanna, I wanna thank you, Brian, Jeremy, Stephanie, Jamie, Brad. Um, we put a lot of hours, y'all put a lot more hours than we did, but I mean, we put a lot of hours in this and uh, you know, we've been on the budget committee, Jamie and I have for the past six years and this is the most we've ever, we've ever dug. And so I, I just wanna say thank you. Yeah, I mean, y'all y'all did an outstanding job and you know, here's to hoping that it turns out better than it really is. Right. Well, we hope that our governor and our state representative, Cody Harris, will realize, I mean, it's not just us, it's pretty much every school district in the state. Yeah. Um, if they're not passing a deficit budget, it, that's really rare. Um, and so if they don't do something next year, we're gonna have to look at cutting programs and cutting, I mean, if we don't get paid for 450 kids that's a campus I mean that is that's a school yeah. and if we're not getting paid for a whole school we might have to to look at consolidating and and we and we're busting at the seams at our schools so we really can't do that but I mean how do we how, how do we how do we you know overcome that I mean you can't until our state lawmakers do something to fund us and hopefully they will get the message loud and clear that that everybody is having this issue and it's effect, going to affect our kids at some point so thank you thank you okay next on the agenda is credit by exam date Um, so the district is required to provide a minimum of six credit, um, six credit by exam dates throughout the school year, and those will be August the 24th, October 5th, November 2nd, December 7th, March 8th, May 3rd, and June 7th. And we will need approval for these dates. I move to approve, approve proposed dates by credit by exam. So we have a motion and a second to approve the proposed dates for credit by exam. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move into closed session as permitted by Texas Governance Code Section 551.01. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. A motion is second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Consent agenda is approved. 
Now we will adjourn into closed session as permitted by Texas Governance Code 551.01.